Can you hear me okay? Good morning and welcome. My name is Jacob Redsby, and it's my honor to serve as the Smith P Minus Dean of Gonzaga Law School and welcome you to our conference today, Expo 74, 50 Years of Environmental Justice. We are proud to co-sponsor this event as an offering of our Center for Law, Ethics, and Commerce, an academic center of ours that advances our social justice mission by examining how attorneys can and should advise corporations to further the common good. Please accept my welcome on behalf of the center's co-directors, Professor Angela Ramirez, and our colleague, Professor Jessica Kaiser, who cannot be here this morning uh, due to illness. They led the law school's effort in organizing this conference, joining our Center for Law, Ethics, and Commerce as co-sponsors of the Washington State Attorney General's Office, the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Washington, and Gonzaga University's Institute for Climate, Water, and the Environment, which is so ably led by my colleague, Professor Brian Penny, about whom you will hear more in a minute. We recognize that Gonzaga University stands on the traditional lands of the Spokane Tribe, part of the Interior Salish Group, which has inhabited northeastern Washington, northern Idaho, and western Montana for many centuries. Gonzaga also is near the traditional lands of eight other tribes whose seals, along with the Spokane Tribes, adorn the wall behind me as a reminder of their irrevocable connection to this region and this place that non-tribal members now have the privilege of inhabiting and calling home. I would argue that because we have that privilege, we also have the attendant duty to care for and protect these lands and the common resources upon which all our lives depend. Today's event provides us the opportunity to do just that by reflecting on the environmental legacy of Expo 74, both what has been accomplished and the work that remains. Before I hand the microphone to Professor Henning, I want to take a moment to applaud his leadership of the Institute for Climate, Water, and the Environment. I first met Brian in January of 2019, pre-pandemic, when he wrote me an email in his then capacity as Gonzaga's Faculty Fellow for Sustainability and Chair of the Environmental Studies Department. As he put it in an email soliciting the law school's involvement in his work, quote, given the scale and worsening severity of global climate change, it is imperative that Gonzaga consider ways to focus our considerable intellectual talent to be of service to both our Gonzaga community and the inland Northwest. He was right then, and I am so delighted to see that his hard work has paid off in the creation of the institute that now bears the imprimatur of Gonzaga University and the most recent iteration of our strategic plan. Brian, you've been a tireless advocate and indefatigable leader, and I applaud your vision for this institute and your determination for its work to make an impact. Indeed, it already is. Speaking of impacts, I know of no better vehicle for enacting change than through our legal system. We are fortunate to have in our U.S. attorney, Vanessa Waldorf, not only a person with strong Gonzaga ties as one of our longstanding esteemed adjunct professors, but also a champion of using the legal system to affect environmental justice. We are so lucky to have someone of her environmental expertise leading the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District. And we are also fortunate to have Bob Ferguson, a person who has kept concern for the environment at the forefront of his administration of the Office of Attorney General. I am not an environmental law expert, my confession, but I do love the outdoors, and as a climber, hiker, and camper, have come to appreciate the countless beautiful lakes and mountains and rivers and prairies and forests of the inland Northwest. As we faced days of record-breaking heat in Spokane this past summer, I was struck by the pithy statement on a homes homespun sign in the yard of one of my neighbors on the South Hill. Do you believe in climate change now? As we reflect on recent news of uncharacteristically warm snowpacks in our region this past winter, it doesn't take an environmental scientist to know that we have major problems caused or exacerbated by human behavior. So what are we humans who care to do about it? That, lead me, that leads me back to law and our plans here at Gonzaga Law School. For many years, the law school announced an environmental law and land use clinic under the legal direction of Greg Eichstadt. 
which allowed students the invaluable opportunity of working to affect environmental change for good while earning credit toward their JD degree. With the great initial success of the University's Institute for Climate, Water, and the Environment, and with its full support and encouragement, I am excited to share with this audience of like-minded colleagues that the law school is working in earnest to resurrect our environmental law clinic in response to the overwhelming student interest and regional need. Like many impactful initiatives, benefactor and grant support will be critical to meeting this goal. So please stay tuned for more information on this front in the months to come, including ways to support and sustain the clinic's work. It is now my honor to introduce you to the two brains behind today's event and the guiding force behind our Institute for Climate, Water, and the Environment, Dr. Brian Henning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today in person uh, and for those of you who are online as well. Hi, everybody at home. Still in your pajamas, maybe. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Hill, and as Dean Rick Spee mentioned, I'm a professor of philosophy and environmental studies here at Gonzaga. I've been here for 16 years, originally from uh, southern Idaho, grew up in Boise. Uh, and I've really been honored over the last three years. This month, we celebrate the three year anniversary of this academic project, the Institute for Climate, Water, and Environment. And uh, we are really just getting started, but have already uh, had so many uh, exciting uh, opportunities to contribute to the work of our community. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, recognizing all of the wonderful people who made this possible. The actual things behind uh, this is actually not me, uh, but uh, Vanessa Lager uh, purchased, approached uh, us with the idea of, of looking for an opportunity uh, with the celebration of Expo 50, or the 50th anniversary of Expo 74, uh, to connect uh, that environmentally themed event uh, with the work around environmental justice uh, that her office and so many others ably uh, pursue. And then we reached out to our colleagues at the Attorney General's office, and they're very eager also to join us. And so it was a very easy and natural collaboration uh, between the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, for the District of Eastern Washington, the Attorney General's Office, the Institute, and then the Law School Center for Commerce, Ethics, and, and Law. So we're really excited to have you here today. Uh, also, before I forget, uh, you know uh, that uh, I get to stand up here and, and make comments, but really the, the folks who make it happen are, are sitting over here and, and outside making it happen. And so if we could give them a, a round of applause, thanking them for your hard work. We really, uh, the work that the Institute does is really, as Ms. Andrews worked by the organization, is a function of the people who do it, and uh, they are amazing and very important work. Uh, from that way, it's a very simple one too. Housekeeping. Uh, some of you might have already noticed the food down the hall. Uh, the coffee all day. Uh, the bathrooms are already down there, so uh, you can find that. Uh, this is being streamed and recorded and will be posted uh, soon on our YouTube channel. If you wanted to refer to portions of it, maybe assuming that the technology cooperates, uh, that is our plan. So the mission of uh, this academic project that I have the pleasure of leading is, is bold. As, as Dean Nixon mentioned, and it's fun that you need to find an email to uh, framing this. The idea was uh, that Gonzaga has the opportunity, and I would argue the responsibility, to be leading in our region to help our community to understand and respond to a changing climate. And, that needs to take lots of different forms, and it's not only uh, about the, what we do in the classroom, I mean, that's critically important. It's also about uh, how can we be of service to the inland Northwest uh, and communities. And so we started thinking about how we would uh, engage young people. So one of the first projects we launched uh, is called the Climate Literacy Project, and my colleague Carly Hombine, uh, one of the chief architects of, of this event, and the needs of the group of uh, Gonzaga students and, and uh, our wonderful mentor, a volunteer, Cali. Uh, going into uh, 12 classrooms in our region, uh, Gonzaga students hands on lessons about different aspects of the climate crisis and, and, and renewable energy. We go in classrooms and get students excited about understanding different aspects of climate change uh, so they can grow up to be parts of the solution. So we do that wonderful work uh, every day. Then after the 2021 deep film, 
uh, that uh, was so devastating to our, our region, uh, killed um, 19 people in Spokane County in terms of the numbers from the medical examiner. Uh, but if you consider excess mortality, it was probably closer to 100 people, 700 people statewide. Um, it's the numbers we had are striking. That was the most deadly weather event in Washington state history uh, in 2021. So shortly after, we launched uh, the Spokane Heat the Heat project to try and help our community understand how uh, heat affects our community. Uh, and, and that is aided by Dante Jester and the climate resilience team, uh, as well as uh, several colleagues, uh, Dean Hibbert and Robert Dyson. Uh, who help us to understand how is heat distributed throughout our community to help map our the heat islands, uh, work with the Department of Health to connect those data to uh, uh, information regarding demographics, how are uh, urban heat islands related to uh, differences in race and income. We found that in Spokane, there are strong statistical correlations between the color of your skin and the amount of money in your wallet and whether or not you're likely to live in a place that has more urban heat and less green space. And in a fair community, that wouldn't be the case. We shouldn't find strong statistical correlations like that. That's an instance of environmental injustice. Uh, if you're interested in more about that beat the heat work, we have two posters uh, that we've worked on with uh, colleagues from the University of Washington's uh, Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences that you can see over on the side here during the breaks. You can check out some of the research uh, that we've been doing. And using that to help guide policy making, decision making, and coordinating with colleagues such as our friend at the Lands Council, working on spray canopy and planting urban trees, using the urban heat island data, and so on. So, I just mentioned what I think is the key term for discussion today, uh, which is environmental justice. And uh, That'll hopefully be increasingly clear about what that looks like today. But I thought it would be helpful to just start off, especially given uh, our keynote speaker today, with the EPA's definition of environmental justice. And I've highlighted here two uh, aspects that I think are, are most crucial, one having to do with just treatment and the other having to do with meaningful involvement. So just treatment has to do with the, that idea that I mentioned with, with respect to heat, where we where in a you know just treatment would suggest that the neighborhood you live in shouldn't be a predictor of, of whether or not your, your community is warmer um, you know, on, a, on a hot summer day. Uh, so the, the just distribution means that no community should suffer uh, disproportionate environmental burdens relative to others. And so pursuing environmental justice means making sure that uh, everybody uh, lives in a community where they, they uh, have equal shares of environmental benefits and environmental burdens. The other part that I think is many sometimes not uh, focused on as much as it needs to be, uh, but is equally important is the meaningful involvement part. Uh, so, you know, communities need to be able to have meaningful opportunities to uh, participate in and affect the outcomes of decisions that affect them. So that in a society that was environmentally just, community members would have the opportunity to actively participate and shape uh, the decision makings, decisions that, that are affecting them. And this is challenging because sometimes those meetings happen during the day and community members have jobs. Uh, and so, you know, they have to decide between participating in those things or foregoing wages, for example, which uh, is, an, is a difficult choice. Or childcare or transportation, right? There are all these burdens to meaningful, uh, meaningful involvement. So some of the things that we've been doing and, and others, especially I think led by the Department of Health, there's a really good example of this in the HEAL Act and uh, the environmental justice that's going on, uh, work that's going on in Washington is creating opportunities to fund community members to participate in uh, decision-making processes uh, so that they're actually given uh, resources to make up for lost wages or to pay for childcare or to pay for transportation. Uh, and that's what uh, justice would require if we're going to give them uh, true opportunities to participate, not just sort of say everybody can come, but reducing barriers to participation is really important as well. In your packet, if you uh, bring on what you picked up, you might also have, um, the, you're not meant to be able to read that, it's just sort of the, the one in your packet. Um, this is uh, a longer list of a, sort of a more complicated definition of environmental justice that was uh, framed by the first uh, National uh, People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991 that has 17 different aspects to it. And so uh, the Climate Institute, if you're Gonzaga, is really interested in the broadest possible conception of environmental justice. And so we included this as sort of to um, add additional depth to conversations uh, about what environmental justice might entail. 
And so uh, part of what we might be talking about together today is thinking about that as well. The second thing I was hoping to do in just opening is to do something about the, the Jesuits, uh, so Gonzaga is a Jesuit university, Jesuits called composition of place, trying to think about where we are today uh, physically and how we got to be here uh, in this region. Uh, Gonzaga has the fortune to have sitting on uh, a beautiful part of the river in a beautiful city. Uh, the law school there is actually, I think, really pretty much in the center uh, upper part of that. The river is off to the, the, the east side there, uh, uh, and the Lake Arthur uh, is, oops, is in the, uh, is, is next to it, uh, St. Al's uh, in, in the foreground. So how did we get here, uh, Gonzaga? How did we all get here uh, today? And, and um, yeah, this will worry you, but I'm going to go back about 15,000 years. <laughs> and uh, because I think we have such a fascinating uh, geological history uh, that is, is really continues to shape what we are, who we are, what we're doing, what our uh, challenges are. So uh, regularly, there were, during the last, I'm not sure why this is dancing when I'm not touching anything. Uh, someone's got another clicker. Um, so during the last ice, end of the last ice age, uh, especially uh, in the northern Rockies, ice dams would form. And as the uh, ice was retreating, it would form massive uh, lakes uh, on the east side of the Rockies uh, called Glacial Lake Missoula. And it would regularly uh, break that. That would break and regularly rush through this area, carving uh, off the soil, um, exposing that uh, the salt that we see all around. Uh, so that formed our region in a really fundamental way for uh, thousands of years. And much of our, our rich soil is actually growing grapes down in the Willamette area uh, because it, it sort of got washed uh, down. Uh, but you can still see uh, the, the remnants of this in the scab lines. You can see this uh, in, in uh, the Columbia Gorge. You can see how that shaped our area. As I hope we'll talk a lot about today, uh, there were uh, people who have been part of this region for thousands of years uh, as well. And so this is a beautiful map that depicts some of the traditional territorial boundaries of communities in this region. And so you can see the Spokane and you can see the Coeur d'Alene and you can see uh, uh, the, the Nespoon and, and uh, the Kalispell and so on. Um, and they're overlapping and they're sort of beautiful as opposed to sort of the traditional you know, rigid boundaries. We have these sort of beautiful overlapping intersections of communities uh, that lived in these lands for uh, since time immemorial for, for thousands and thousands of years. Gonzaga started in the 1880s when a community of uh, Native Americans uh, went east and uh, found them, I believe, in St. Louis and invited uh, them to come to this region to start a university, which is a really interesting way of starting. Didn't do that. Uh, Father Cataldo was uh, the founder of the university, made uh, relationships, learned some Salish. Uh, we also have sort of, I would say, uh, uh, Gonzaga's original sin was that uh, when we finally did build a building uh, and, and some Native students came to enroll, uh, we turned them away. Uh, in part because of the people who funded the building of the of the school um, said that you weren't allowed to enroll students. And so we were invited here and then promptly denied those very people the opportunity to benefit from uh, the education that we were providing. So we have a lot to make up for as a university having started on such a wrong foot with uh, the community members who were already here. In the 1880s, uh, Spokane was a rough place. Uh, this is uh, hard to believe, but that's Monroe Street Bridge on the left there. Uh, would not be excited to cross that. <laughs> um, and I, I've heard stories that there were hatches in the bridge to uh, drop trash into the river because, you know, that's a good way to get rid of it because, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> so, I, uh, if you haven't uh, already read Jess Walters' uh, Cold News, uh, he's our, our most famous, well regarded author, local author, arguably. He wrote this book, uh, Cold Millions, recently, which is about Spokane in uh, 1909. We were a boom town, we were a timber mining town, and drilling in really, really 
be fast. And if you want a beautiful depiction of sort of um, Spokane as like one of the characters of the book, I think in a, in a really interesting way. We have the Silver Valley just to our east, which um, you know brought lots of people here and also brought lots of heavy metals into our waterways and into our lakes and are still uh, affecting uh, us today. Eventually, we built a bigger Monroe Street Bridge, and it's really interesting to, to think about the way the track used to go around. It's hard to imagine how high that would have been. But uh, Kendall Yards, this was the rail, the rail uh, uh, spray that would go to Kendall Yards above Monroe. Uh, for those of you who are locals, uh, it's hard to imagine. And, and that was one of the things that um, Expo uh, eliminated was those, uh, all of those tracks. And, and so part of what we're celebrating is the really visionary decision to uh, remove all of the rails that were at the center of, this, of the town and replace it with a beautiful park uh, that we're able to enjoy now. Gonzaga in this time period, uh, well, we had a football team, and but it was uh, still undefeated uh, since it no longer exists. And, uh, <laughs> so this is actually uh, the bend in the river right by Gonzaga just out here. And Lake Arthur, uh, was not a lake. It was actually just a bend in the river. And so uh, out here where the soccer fields are, just, just uh, we could, you know, uh, less than 100 yards away from here uh, was the McGoldrick uh, Timber Company. And they would take uh, logs and they would dump them into this bend in the river uh, for the mill. And so that was just on campus. In fact, there were stories that cinders from the McGoldrick uh, Timber Company would, uh, would blow into the windows of College Hall where students were studying. So it was a little different uh, at the beginning of last century. So uh, that's what it looked like uh, it, around 1910. And, and this is what it looks like uh, today, uh, just outside our doors. You can see in the foreground um, all of the logs. And the Timber Company, this was our, our football stadium. This is College uh, Hall and St. Al's over here. And this is the, the river and the bend in the river. McGoldrick uh, became a rather, rather large. A lot of the housing built in Logan and the neighborhoods to the east of Hamilton were actually housing for the Timber Company. So a lot of the housing we have in the neighborhood uh, was uh, to, to uh, house those people. It burned down in 1945. And so they uh, ended up donating, I believe, the, the land to Gonzaga, uh, which then eventually became the last one, um, much, much later. And so this is what it looked like um, uh, at, shortly after uh, the fire and as they started rebuilding it. So that's, that's the, again, that's uh, looking at Lake Arthur uh, um, there. This was the regional university building, which also burned down, um, no, longer, no longer exists there. So, in the time I've got left, uh, I'd like to just hit on what I see as some of the, the things when I was imagining what are some of the key environmental justice issues for our region. I'm just going to pictorially sort of race through them, maybe as, again, setting up uh, conversations for the panels and comments that we'll have throughout the day. Uh, to my mind, one of the most momentous was the decision to ban the Columbia so this is what the Spokane Falls looked like prior to the, the damming of the rivers. Um, here's another shot of the main uh, upper falls, I believe. That's the upper falls. Here's Keller Falls. Salulo Falls. And then starting in the 30s, we have these massive infrastructure projects to build these uh, very large dams to create you know, these uh, forms of energy for the growing population of the West. Bonneville, Grand Coulee, which these are the dams that were submerging the falls that you're, you know, Salilo and Kettle. And of course, it also had the uh, impact of eliminating the salmon runs or all, all but eliminating the salmon runs. And so uh, when you think about, uh, you know, one, uh, we decided, or some people decided to, to uh, dam the rivers, create this energy, which is um, a nice source of renewable energy in our state. But it also, right, we had that benefit that was created. Uh, but we also had this disproportionate burden that some community members then, right, so the tribes and the tribes whose lives were, you know, 
for thousands of years around the salmon uh, could no longer uh, have their traditional forms of, of living because of the salmon runs were disturbed. Forwarding a little bit more, we also have at Hanford um, the creation of uh, the atomic bomb, which uh, was only possible through the mining of uh, plutonium for the initial bomb, and then later uh, uranium. And uh, across the country, we find that many of the places where that mining was taking place were on tribal lands. Uh, here in our community, the Spokane has the Midnight Mine, which is still uh, a legacy um, a really mine that is still causing uh, terrible health problems. And so, um, you know, some people benefited, um, some people are disadvantaged and continue to be disadvantaged, and they're not the same people. And that is uh, what environmental justice is worried about, is, is that disproportionate benefits and burdens, who bears the, gets the benefits, who bears the burdens. Fast forwarding a little bit more, getting closer to the present, we have the creation of the interstate system. The building of I-90 right through the heart of Spokane and lots of communities uh, sacrificed uh, you know, on that path, uh, including uh, Lewis and Clark High School, which had its annex, uh, had to be demolished in order to put it in. Uh, but the community that arguably suffered the, the largest consequences was East Central, uh, which had a beautiful park, Liberty Park, and about 80% of the park um, was eliminated in order to put in um, the, the large interchange. So it looked, used to look like that, and now it looks like this. And so uh, East Central was a historically uh, African American community, uh, and uh, so friends were on one side of the freeway, the other side of the freeway, businesses, churches, residential. Uh, and now with the North South Freeway, we have it again. Let me get to Expo, and I won't be talking a lot about this today, so this is just uh, just to give some pictorial sort of framing. But we, we did have this really ugly uh, downtown, really, really industrial, gritty uh, downtown. The rail yards were right in the middle of downtown, and they were running in every direction. And so uh, the community's decision to uh, commit to a world fair in a small town like ours uh, was a big one. Traditionally, I would say that they're kind of uh, being all those, I mean, the idea of hosting a big event and uh, there'll be all these benefits, I think it usually doesn't pan out. I, I think Spokane is an unusual example where it really did leave something beautiful for the community for generations after. Um, as they, you know, these rails were separating the, the downtown from the river. You, you had to go through, uh, if you could, all of these ugly rail yards to get to the river. So they limit, moved all the rails, started cleaning the land for uh, the expo, uh, built the Washington Pavilion, took down most of the train station, leaving the clock tower, and had this environmentally themed uh, event. I don't think this, there's a lot of dispute that Chief Seattle ever said anything like this, but uh, it is a very nice environmental code that both does not belong to man and belongs to the earth. So this environmentally themed expo event, and uh, it was quite grand, and it was quite interesting to be able to have that uh, in our community. And we're here now, 50 years later, and uh, so kind of taking from 15,000 years ago up to roughly 74. And now, today, much of the time is going to be spent talking about uh, the work that we've tried to do together over the last 50 years, and then we'll end the day uh, with an open conversation about what work is left to be done in, in the next 50 years, and so that's how, how we'll be paced. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker today. Vanessa R. Waldreth uh, became the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Washington uh, in 2021. U.S. Attorney Waldorf was nominated by President Biden and was unanimously confirmed by the Senate, which I didn't think that was possible to have anything. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, if I didn't say it all, I don't know who I would. Waldorf is responsible for overseeing the, the prosecution of any federal crime case brought within the 20 counties of Eastern Washington. The office also represents the United States in all civil matters brought within this territory. Attorney Waldrop is from Spokane, with deep roots in eastern Washington. 
She served as an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern Dis District of Washington from 2013 to 2020, handling a wide variety of civil and criminal cases. Most recently, U.S. Attorney Walter served as a trial attorney with the Environmental and Natural Resources Division of the United States Department of Justice, where she litigated cases in federal courts around the country, arising under a range of environmental protection statutes. After graduating from Gonzaga Prep here in Spokane, U.S. Attorney Walter received her BA Magna Cum Laude from Georgetown University in 2002 and a JD from Georgetown as well in 2008. Please join me in welcoming Vanessa Walter. Thank you very much, Brian. That was such a wonderful framing. And as someone who grew up right here in Spokane and now lives uh, in the Logan neighborhood, that was really a kind of story of our my growing up and how the environment plays such a critical part in how we live our lives and uh, where we live our lives. So I grew up right here in Spokane and seeing uh, the impact of I-90 my dad uh, grew up in East Central. And so when we were growing up, and I think my sister's here too, where you get, you get all the wall drifts today. Um, and we would point out, oh, that's his house, because you could see it right from I-90 on that one of those first line uh, communities that were really negatively impacted by I-90 coming through. And those are now communities that have, you know, disproportionate amounts of maybe lead or arsenic that come from the pollution that comes out of our cars. So all of this is the story of Spokane. Uh, so a little bit more about uh, me. I grew up here in Spokane and uh, ran Bloom's Day with my dad, saw you know the Spokane River from the Centennial Trail where we would bike, uh, came down to Riverfront Park where we would watch the 4th of July uh, fireworks underneath the butterfly statues. And really, although didn't experience Expo myself, felt the spirit of Expo and everything. You know in Spokane, uh, if you're from Spokane, that people love Expo 74. It is uh, truly this spirit of energy and hope and optimism about, we did this awesome thing for our community. And I was so excited to be able to uh, plan this event with the Climate Institute and Brian. And, and it, the brainstorm of this happened when we met about the Climate Institute and some you know, environmental initiatives that I was excited to do with my office and learned about the great work that the Climate Institute is doing around the heat dome, really concrete things, and thought, what can we do to make this a part of the Expo 50 year anniversary celebrations? And these 50 years from 1974 really reflect a time period in our nation's history of early environmental statutes. When I taught environmental law here at uh, Gonzaga, we would always kick off with the 1970s were a time of incredible hope and optimism for the environment. It, these statutes, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, these all only came to be in the early 1970s. And those happened because we saw a need in our country for an incredible amount of attention for environmental protection. There were rivers on fire, there was the impact of pollution, and those statutes came about in a desire to have those uh, ailments to our environment be remedied. And the Clean Water Act, I always think about kind of the, the opening uh, preamble speaks to, yeah, we'll have this water cleaned up in about 10, 20 years. <laughs> and turns out that that's a much harder and more complicated uh, area than, than we thought in the early 1970s. So kind of bringing it back to kind of the vision of this event was, well, let's think about all the great accomplishments that we have made in 50 years since the expo and how has the environmental protection efforts of these statutes provided such positive benefits. But we also need to look at how much more do we need to do? What are the challenges that exist right now? And it can be also very, very overwhelming um, when we, you know, you get emails from all the news that say there's new problems, the, the climate feels very overwhelming. You get stories about how, uh, you know, youth these days have climate anxiety. I have climate anxiety. This is really a hard time. 
So how do we kind of harness the ideas and energy that was present in 1974, where we had this theme of environmental sustainability as part of this world's fair, this vision of what can we do as a community better together? And I'm so thrilled to be able to be part of this day's events. Uh, and I have an amazing group of people that I get to speak with uh, today. So I'll, I'll go over a little bit of um, what, the, what the day holds and then a little bit more about what uh, I and my office are doing within the Department of Justice to promote environmental protection and safe and healthy communities. All right, so today is gonna involve uh, two really wonderful dynamic panels. And this is going to be kicking off with one focused on the Spokane River. As you saw in the, the framing of today's event, the river was really the you know central point of the expo events. And it's, it remains that of our city today. We have the beautiful you know Centennial Trail that maps along the Spokane River and a riverfront park, which was created from the expo. So we're gonna talk about what are efforts that we have uh, successfully done to clean the Spokane River, what was done at the, the time of Expo, and then what was the necessary follow-up work that was so important. The theme of celebrating tomorrow's fresh new environment was not fully captured by how clean the water was at the time of Expo, but it certainly was a lot better. The uh, in fact, had cleaned up the water enough to have in the opening ceremonies, the release of 1974 trout into the river. So this was a celebration of, of the river and it was a massive cleanup of the downtown rail yards and their transformation into what became our beautiful riverfront park. So although this was visually impressive, it left unaddressed many less obvious environmental challenges. And in the 50 years since Expo 74, Progress has been made. One major victory was the city of Spokane's integrated clean water plan, which much like Expo 74, required the cooperation of numerous groups, including the city of Spokane, the Department of Ecology and the Riverkeeper. This plan addressed sewage overflows into the Spokane River, as well as next level pollutant treatment at the wastewater treatment facility. Yet we still have pervasive challenges with toxics in our water and we don't have uh, the ability for our river to support salmon right now with low summer river flows and high water temperatures. So these challenges reflect the limitations of our current environmental laws and limitations that are seen on larger scale across many other environmental issues. And they raise the question of what's, what's next for the next 50 years of environmental justice here in the Inland Northwest and for our nation. And then we also have, uh, I'm so excited to have our uh, keynote speaker, Cliff Villa from the Environmental Protection Agency come. He's literally written the book on environmental justice and uh, that is taught in uh, environmental classes uh, throughout law schools uh, throughout our country. Then we'll talk a little bit more about enforcement. And I'm really excited to be hosting our enforcement panel this afternoon to talk both about the work that the department is doing as well as right here in Washington state around critical environmental protection statutes and our civil rights statutes. So be ready for a great day of uh, wonderful uh, discussions around what are the limitations of enforcement? What are the possibilities of enforcement? And what can citizens do? Hearing from citizens groups like the Riverkeeper and from community activist groups um, that are advocating for indigenous uh, rights and for the protection of their traditional treaty rights. So I'm really thrilled that we have this wonderful group of people able to speak with us uh, this afternoon. So I wanna thank the co-sponsors as well, the Climate Institute, Gonzaga Law School, the Attorney General's Office, and my team, uh, many folks from the U.S. Attorney's Office. I want to give a huge kudos to uh, my colleague, Katrina Manis, who really helped uh, coordinate today's events and uh, is the reason that I'm standing here today <laughs> making this all happen. So thank you very much, Katrina. So circling back to what our office is doing, um, I have the incredible privilege to serve as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Washington. And this is the 20 counties east of the Cascades up to Canada, down to Oregon and to the Idaho border. So that's a beautiful, amazing space of land. We have national forests, we have uh, tribal lands. There's so much that is to be celebrated about uh, the natural spaces that we have there. 
And in my work uh, prior to being the United States attorney, I had the amazing privilege of working on cases for the Forest Service and uh, also with the Department of Energy at the Hanford Nuclear Facility. So in doing those uh, work on the national forests, I had the, the greatest opportunity to do site visits to the Colville National Forest and understand about how do we do appropriate uh, tree cutting that can allow for our forests to have more vitality and more resilience so that we don't have the dangers of catastrophic wildfires that we've seen in the past few years. And we see increasing with the dangers of climate change. In my work at the Hanford Nuclear Facility, we are you know, ensuring that uh, the Department of Energy is fulfilling its mission of environmental remediation. Also, I do a lot of work with my white collar team in ensuring that the federal funds that are going to uh, the environmental remediation efforts are being properly invested in those and carried through rather than going to government contractors who are uh, engaged in waste, fraud, or abuse. So because of this expertise in doing environmental work, which is really enforcement work that serves our community and serves our district, I had the amazing opportunity uh, when I came into being the United States Attorney to be selected as the uh, subcommittee chair of the Environmental Justice and Environmental Issues uh, subcommittee that advises the Attorney General. And this is during a moment when the department is very committed to having a comprehensive environmental justice strategic plan. So I've been able to be present in communication with the Office of Environmental Justice and advocate within the U.S. Attorney Office community for how we can use all available tools to improve the environment and use a variety of environmental protection statutes and other federal tools to ensure that we are doing all we can to promote environmental justice. At the core of the department's environmental justice work is that all Americans, no matter their economic status, their zip code or the color of their skin should have clean air to breathe, have access to safe drinking water and be protected from worsening effects of climate change. Yet too often communities of color, low income communities and tribal communities suffer disproportionately. So recognizing this, the Department of Justice's environmental justice work is guided by four principles. We're prioritizing cases that will reduce public health and environmental harms to overburdened and underserved communities. We're making strategic use of all available legal tools to address environmental justice concerns. We're ensuring meaningful engagement with impacted communities, and we are promoting transparency in our environmental justice enforcement. So the way that I'm enforcing and implementing these principles right here in Eastern Washington has been uh, working for events just like today, which is wonderful, um, and also engaging in community listening sessions. We had uh, one of our first community listening sessions uh, several weeks ago where we invited community members and uh, public health members, governmental uh, entities to come and meet and talk about what are the environmental issues that are most impacting our communities, especially our underserved communities or disproportionately impacted uh, communities. And those types of events, I think, are so critical to be able to connect with the communities directly understand what enforcement is the best area for us to use our uh, enforcement powers and to have voices heard from the very beginning in understanding what are the remedies that are gonna be best serving our communities overall. Also, at these events that we've hosted with the Climate uh, Institute, we brought in uh, technical assistance uh, support because there's a huge amount of federal funds that are available right now under the Inflation Reduction Act or other federal statutes that are ready to go out the door to serve environmental uh, justice efforts. And it's really critical that the communities who most need those funds and have the you know, vision for how to use those effectively receive those monies. So there are these technical assistance centers throughout the United States and in Region 10, uh, where we've been able to connect uh, community leaders and community organizations directly with the resources to be able to apply for those grants. So much environmental uh, work is actually done through grant making in order to be able to promote these types of environmental efforts. So that's one area where we've been trying to meaningfully engage with the community to ensure that we are hearing the voices of the communities impacted by environmental degradation. 
We also held a tribal and federal summit, and that was a really critical uh, event that was important to me, where we had, had a national summit uh, at the National Advocacy Center, uh, where the, there had been the Environment and Natural Resources, Indian Resources section, communicating about what are ways that we can ensure that we are advocating effectively with tribes to protect their tribal homelands and protect treaty rights. And I wanted to have the main justice department that is mostly based in Washington, DC, come right out to beautiful Spokane, Washington and be able to meet directly with tribes right here in Spokane. They also went on a site visit to see the Coeur d'Alene uh, Lake and efforts to be involved in environmental protection efforts there. So I was so proud that we were able to host right here in the Inland Northwest, the first regional summit, bringing together the Department of Justice's specialized group on Indian resources and uh, protecting tribal homelands right here in Spokane, and to hear directly from tribal leaders and tribal lawyers to talk about what are ways that the department has either historically failed or can do better in the future to protect uh, tribal treaty rights. So that's been an area that I've been very proud to work on and uh, know that we have so much more to do and I'm excited for the opportunities that we, we can uh, be supportive of moving forward. An effort that we've also uh, kicked off recently is kicking off the uh, environmental task force for the Eastern District of Washington. And I feel like the timing of this event uh, is excellent with our uh, recent kickoff because it involves so many of the engaged partners here at this event today. Our Attorney General's Office, the Department of Ecology, uh, the Environmental Protection uh, Agency's uh, Criminal Investigative Division is our, our lead agency in environmental enforcement actions. And the goal of this task force is to bring all of these enforcement entities together share information around where we're seeing the biggest violations, the impacts in our communities, and identify that we want to use our enforcement efforts effectively together. And this task force meeting that we just recently had was a wonderful way for us to build those relationships. And the way that environmental protection works is often very delegated. So we have local agencies like the Spokane Clean Air Agency, which we've all gotten to know a lot uh, more intimately when we've had these awful uh, smoke events in Spokane where we're checking the website so quickly to see is the, is the air clear, is the air safe for us to be outside. So that agency is very involved in environmental protection efforts around asbestos remediation and ensuring that our air is clear bringing folks together from the ecology. So, so many of our environmental protections are handled at the state level. And then when there are federal opportunities for enforcement, making sure that we're there at the table to be able to bring our uh, federal enforcement tools, including our very powerful uh, wire fraud and other fra fraudulent uh, white collar efforts to ensure that all the funds that need to be going to our environmental enforcement efforts are being done so effectively and fairly. A few types of cases that my office has already brought, and we are now uh, partnering to do even, even more so, are actions under the Clean Air Act involving hazardous asbestos removal. We're engaged in consumer protection efforts uh, involving unsanitary adulterated fruit juice being sold to the free and reduced cost lunch program. And as I keep mentioning, because our office has such a strong team, fraud cases where money that was intended for environmental remediation at Hanford was instead wasted by government contractors. So those are areas that are key enforcement goals of the Eastern District of Washington. And I'm proud to say that uh, so many of those areas are being replicated across the country following the model that we have been having of engaging with our community, having these types of meaningful engagement community listening sessions, kicking off environmental task forces so that they can have more effective and cohesive and collaborative enforcement, and having a very focused attention to what are the remedies that are best serving our communities. If we're able to bring an enforcement action, how are we ensuring that that enforcement action is one, making the community where there was disproportionate pollution remediated? How do we make sure that, that those efforts are going to supplemental environmental protection projects or efforts that really serve our underserved populations? So I think I've, I've thanked 
all the right people. Uh, if I haven't, thank you again for our panelists, our co-sponsors, and uh, everyone who helped put this wonderful event together. Um, oh, I think the other folks that I wanted to thank or all the uh, people in Spokane who are really revitalizing uh, the legacy and the energy of Expo through this 50 year celebration project. Uh, this event uh, is kind of a precursor to the big events that are coming up in May. And uh, we wanted to make sure we hosted this event during the school year so that law students would be able to participate right here uh, at the law school and undergraduates from Gonzaga as well. Um, so I've been so excited to be able to work with those teams that are focusing on you know, the five pillars that uh, were present at the uh, Expo celebration, the Expo legacy, environmental stewardship, tribal culture, recreation and sport, and, and arts and culture. And I think those categories also really capture uh, the wonderful energy of Expo 74. The vision we have for how our beautiful community can continue to be a safe one for recreation, for raising our families. And I'm very excited that we're gonna be able to have the theme of celebrating tomorrow's fresh new environment uh, right here today in Spokane. Today we'll show how the vibrant spirit of Expo lives on in the beautiful Inland Northwest, just as businesses, community leaders, organizations, and environmental groups came together to make the dream of Expo 74 a reality. That energy and collaboration and problem solving is a touchstone for how we can continue to achieve a healthy and safe community for everyone. Thank you. So we have a little time for questions. If anyone has anything to kick it off. Yes. One second, I'll bring the microphone to you because we're live streaming and people at home won't be able to hear the question. So if you wanted to just mention your name and ask your question. Uh, George Taylor, uh, Veterans for Peace in uh, Spokane. My question has to do with the Interstate Commerce Act. Uh, that act, that federal legislation has been used by the Union Pacific Railroad and BNSF as a smokescreen for not, how shall I say, attending to their environmental responsibilities in Spokane as a hundred, over a hundred oil and coal trains pass through this shitty East Day. And the Firefighters Union number 29 says they cannot deal with an East Palestine event like happened in Ohio. Could you briefly address how the interstate Railroad Interstate Commerce Act could be reformed. Oh, I've got a tough uh, law question to kick off the morning. Um, and so thank you for that question. I think it raises so many important issues of how do we you know, balance both federal and state laws that are critical for environmental protection and highlighting the true dangers of you know, toxic substances coming out of train derailments like what happened in East Palestine, which was truly a tragedy and is impacting communities you know, throughout that area so detrimentally. Um, and I'm not fully up to speed on all of the efforts that uh, have now been uh, put into effect for the East Palestine area, but I know that there was uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, many other federal investigators responded to that. And there has now been uh, enforcement action that is, is, is moving forward on that front. And I would absolutely concur with you that we wanna make sure that we don't have those types of events occur here in Eastern Washington and appropriate uh, safety mechanisms that uh, are ensuring that our uh, rail lines and all of our other transportation ports are following the environmental protection laws that we have are, is really a critical enforcement priority for uh, my office and for the EPA. You raise a really challenging question around the uh, interstate commerce uh, regulations, and I, I don't have that answer for you in terms of what a you know appropriate reform would be. But I do know what our efforts are in the environmental justice enforcement strategy is to use all available tools. So maybe the opportunities can be more enforcement mechanisms on the front end to ensure that our uh, you know, trucks and trains are having appropriate emission standards and that we have the the funding and the the able the ability to really ensure that all of our 
transportation infrastructure is focused on how do we have the safest and uh, most effective environmental protection. So I think there's both like the long-term strategies of how do we have the Clean Air Act be a tool for the emissions issues. We have different uh, ability to enforce uh, safety on our rail lines on, on the front end. And hopefully we have uh, the ability to respond effectively and do preventative action to prevent those types of uh, really awful events from occurring. Let's go ahead and uh, thank uh, U.S. Attorney Waldorf, and we'll uh, have lots of opportunities for discussion, but we're going to take about a 15-minute break. There is uh, coffee and food down the hall and restrooms. We'll be here uh, in about 15 minutes. Thanks so much.